Hi everybody, my name is Danny Miller and I'm a combined pediatrics and genetics resident at Seattle Children's Hospital in the University of Washington. I've been interested in long read sequencing for many years now and I'm very excited to tell you about how I've been using it recently to clarify complex structural variants and identify missing variants in patient samples. I'm excited about long read sequencing because I think it will both increase the rate of genetic diagnosis and also shorten the amount of time it takes to make a genetic diagnosis. Now why are both of those things important? Well, identifying the genetic basis of a disease is important because it makes connections between diseases that we couldn't have made before, and these connections might allow us to offer patients novel treatments. A really great example of this comes from a patient that I saw on my very first day of outpatient genetics clinic. You can see here she had a long history of progressive weakness and weight loss that started when she was 8. By the time she was 11, she was so weak she couldn't carry a backpack up the stairs at school, and when she was 12, her friend said, hey, how come your tongue shakes when you stick it out? after which she uh, had persistent tongue fasciculations. And you can see those here in the video. Now, when I met her, her weight was about five standard deviations below average, and her height was in the normal range. And she actually came to us after an exome had revealed a de novo variant in a gene called SPTLC1. This is a serine palmitotrap transferase. And the question was, what do we do next? Well, based on her history and her exam, we suspected she had juvenile onset ALS, and we were actually able to identify two other patients with variants in this gene who also had a diagnosis of juvenile onset ALS. Now, what's notable is that variants in this gene are classically associated with a sensory neuropathy that's called HSAN1A, and this is in patients who lose sensation in their hands and their feet at a fairly young age, and it leads to painless wounds and ulcers. It's kind of like diabetic neuropathy. We see that frequently today. Now, the patients with the ALS phenotype didn't have any sensory loss, so we were a little confused at first. Recently, variants in this gene were also associated with macular telangiectasia type 2, which is an eye disease, and this is in individuals who also had no evidence of the HCN1A phenotype. So clearly, there's variability in the phenotype associated with variants in this gene, and connecting the three diseases wouldn't have been possible without the molecular information. And this was key in our case, as individuals with both HCN1A and macular telangiectasia type 2 have been treated with oral serine, and there's some evidence it slows progression of those diseases, and that allowed us to offer our patient a potentially novel treatment for what's a progressive and ultimately fatal disorder. Now, we, we also know that identifying the molecular basis for a disease saves money, which, for better or for worse, is important to consider. Multiple studies have shown that the cost savings come because once a diagnosis is made, the number of hospitalizations decrease and the number of diagnostic tests decrease. And I don't just mean genetic tests, all diagnostic tests. And finally, and I would argue most importantly, genetic diagnoses help families make decisions about goals of care and the kinds of interventions that they want for their children. Now, the challenge that we have in clinical genetics is that about half of the kids that we see in clinic remain undiagnosed even after a complete workup, and that usually ends after exome sequencing. The workup is systematic, and you can see the progression and the approximate diagnostic rate of each step here. Now, importantly, the workup takes a lot of time, so each of these steps can take months to years to complete, so these families spend a lot of time waiting for a diagnosis. So what I want to know is, can I use a single test, long read sequencing, to change the pattern? simultaneously increasing the rate of diagnosis and also shortening the amount of time it takes to arrive at a diagnosis? That's a really big question, so to address it, we started with a couple of smaller ones. Specifically, we wanted to see how targeted long-read sequencing might be used in clinical genetics today, and we saw two opportunities. First, we wanted to know if targeted long-read sequencing could provide additional clarity in cases in which we found a complex structural change, which we sometimes see when we do a microarray or a karyotype. These could be cases where we see more than one deletion or duplication on an array, or when we do a karyotype and we see a complex rearrangement. We are also interested in missing variant cases, or these cases in which a typical workup revealed a single variant in a gene associated with a recessive disease, or no variant in a disease that we suspect to be excellent or autosomal dominant. Together, these two categories of cases would give us really valuable experience when we started doing whole genomes on completely unsolved cases. So for our project, we needed to decide which targeting strategy to use. Now you're gonna hear a lot of details about different targeting methods in the Innovations and in Targeted Sequencing breakout room and probably other places during the conference. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. But the first option that we considered was just to PCR the regions that we were interested in and then sequence them. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't a great approach for us, as in several cases, we would need to target megabases of space, and in almost all cases, our targets would be unique. We worried about inconsistent results with amplification, and of course, we didn't want to lose the epigenetic information. Now, another option for targeting is to use a Cas9-based approach. And I think this method is really exciting and really useful, but there were several drawbacks for us, which were similar to the PCR-based approach. Using Cas9, it's a little tougher to, tar to target lar large regions of the genome, such as DMD, for example, which is the gene in humans that makes dystrophin, and it's over two megabases in size. 
And again, we would be targeting a different region in every experiment. It makes the Cas9 approach a little bit expensive. So I often say I'd rather be lucky than good. And we got really lucky with the timing of our project as just before we started, uh, the Reed Fish preprint from Matt Luce's group came out. And this was immediately interesting to us as it would let us computationally select specific regions of the genome for sequencing with no limit to how much or how little of the genome we target. So using ReadFish or Read, we, we, we tried using ReadFish or ReadIntel and it worked great. <clears throat> so here I'm showing you data for five chromosomes from the first run that I did, where I targeted about seven megabases of the genome. Now the targeted regions are outlined in blue, coverage is over here on the Y axis, and you can see the coverage is increased in the targeted regions. Now the smaller spikes you see are just 10 KB or 5 KB regions that I targeted. They're enriched, they're just washed out at the scale. So the coverage I get here is about 20x, and that's about what I get on average. I usually end up getting about 20 to 40x coverage, even when I target up to about 150 megabases of the genome. So here I've zoomed in on four specific genes with the targeted region in blue. And again, you can see coverage is increased in the targeted region. Now the data here is uh, generated using a single flow cell, which without read and tell in my hands would give about three to five X coverage of the human genome. So for me, this works out to about a 500% increase in coverage of these target regions. Now next, we wanted to use ReadIntel in regions that we knew uh, had repeat expansions and then changes in methylation because of those expansions. So here I'm showing you a southern from a family in which the proband, which is the filled in box up here, is known to carry an expansion of a triplet repeat within the 5' UTR of XYLT1. This results in methylation and silencing of the gene, and it leads to a disease called Baratella-Scott syndrome. This is a recessive condition where uh, individuals have skeletal dysplasia, short stature, developmental delay. Now, this individual inherited the expansion from his mom. She carried a wild type allele, which is number three here, and then a premutation allele, which is number two. Now, dad's wild type, but the proband inherited a de novo deletion from dad, so the proband only has one copy of the gene that he got from his mom. Using targeted long read sequencing, we were able to identify reads that span the restriction sites, which were uh, used to create the southern, and we were able to recapitulate the gel. Now, each dot is a read, and you can see that the four reads that we recovered in the proband span a wider range than either mom or dad. Now, this isn't un unexpected because when a triplet repeat expands, the individual is actually mosaic. It's not, you know, a certain number of repeats in every cell. It's variable. Now, you can see mom's two haplotypes here, and then you can see that dad has a single haplotype. Now, the colors of the dots correlate to the methylation status, with red being methylated and blue being unmethylated. And when you look at the reads from each family member, you can see that all the reads from the proband are methylated, which makes sense as he carries the expansion, and he, therefore it's silenced. Next, you can see that most of the reads from mom are unmethylated. They're all blue. But two are actually red, so they're methylated. Now, one of those reads terminates within the repeat, so I don't know exactly how long that uh, repeat of that read is. But the other one actually spans the restriction sites, which means that we know it's from the premutation allele. It's been expanded. Um, and that's really cool, right? Because that's what's that, what that's telling you is that mom is mosaic. Some, but not all of her cells, have chosen to silence the premutation allele. This is a level of detail that you never could have gotten using short reads alone. So we knew read until it would work. Um, and so we wanted to ask our first question, can we use it to resolve complex structural changes that are identified on clinical testing? Now, the example I'm going to show is from a patient in which an array identified three non-contiguous deletions within a five megabase region of chromosome six. This was felt to be diagnostic as one of the genes that were bisected by the deletion was ARID1B, and variants in the gene are associated with coffin cyrus syndrome, which fit this case very well. That said, there were several outstanding questions that the array just couldn't answer. Specifically, were all the deletions uh, on one chromosome, or were they on different chromosomes? Was there a deletion and duplication, for example? Was, um, were there rearrangements uh, underneath that we just couldn't see that were associated with the deletions? And finally, did the deletions uncover any pathogenic variants in genes that are associated with recessive disorders? I've seen this before, where a common deletion uncovers an uh, inherited pathogenic variant, so an individual has two genetic diseases. Now, using read and tell, we targeted about 15 megabases around the deletions and got an average depth of coverage of around 20x. And we found five total deletions, two more than were reported on the array. Now, because we had long read data, of course, we, that spanned the deletion breakpoints, we were able to use the reads to determine just how the deletions were linked and whether there were any additional rearrangements. And we were surprised by just how complex of a rearrangement this ended up being. We're calling this plot here a subway plot, and you can just use the line, or you can just follow the line to determine which segments are linked and uh, what their orientation is. <clears throat> and this lets you see that there's one segment um, or two breakpoints that aren't associated with the deletion. And that's something that you can't see on the array. We were then able to reconstruct the segments to determine the new order of the genes within the region, which I'm showing you here. 
And finally, of course, we called variants in the regions that are not haploid, that are where the deletions are, to see if uh, they uncovered any pathogenic variants in genes that are associated with the recessive disorder. And in this case, we didn't find any, which was very reassuring. So next, we wanted to see if we could identify missing variants using targeted long read sequencing. Now again, these are cases that have a single variant that was identified on a typical clinical workup in a gene that's associated with a recessive disease, or no genes identified in a dominant or X-linked disorder. Now to date, we've looked at nine cases that meet the criteria, <clears throat> one of which was from a young man with a disease known as nephronophthysis. Now, in, uh, for this individual, an exome revealed a single paternally inherited stop in NPHP4, and this would actually fit the diagnosis quite well, but there was no second variant found in the gene. So targeting NPHP4, we recovered about 20x coverage of the gene, and we identified the paternally inherited stop using our analysis pipeline. And that included calling variants with Longshot, Claire, and Madaka, and then also calling structural variants with Sniffles and Sfim. And I should mention down here at the bottom for each of these uh, missing variant cases, I'll show you the workup that had been done up to the point where we did targeted long read sequencing. So with our structural variant calling, we did find a structural variant in the gene that I think is interesting and I want to show you because it's a nice example of the extra information and the clarity that long reads can provide. So this is an IGV view of a repeat, which is known to be polymorphic in humans. It's about 200 base pairs in the reference genome. Each of the gray bars you see here is a read, and then the gene body is shown below with an exon over here on the right, and an intron uh, is most of the view actually. And you can see that not every read spans the uh, re repeat expansion, <clears throat> but some do. And those that do show us that there's two haplotypes present, one that's about 800 base pairs, and the second one that's about 1300 base pairs. This lets us determine that both of these repeats, uh, both of these expansions, fall within the range that's been seen in either non-human primates or human samples. And knowing this helps us determine that it's unlikely, although not impossible, of course, that something happened within this repeat that would represent the second hit in this gene for this individual. So the point here is that with short reads alone, we wouldn't be able to definitively exclude this region as being the second hit. But with long reads, we can do that, or at least we have a lot of confidence in that. So fortunately, in this case, we were able to identify a good candidate uh, for a second hit, which is an intronic variant that's predicted by Splice AI to affect splicing. And because we have long reads, we can phase the data in the different haplotypes, and we can determine if the two variants are on the same or different chromosomes. So I phased this using Longshot, and here I'm showing you all reads in the top track, the maternal haplotype in the middle, and the paternal haplotype on the bottom. And you can see the previously known inherited stop. We can then go to that intronic variant, and we can see that the variant's on a different haplotype than the stop was. Now, we did confirm that this is a maternally inherited variant using PCR and Sanger, um, and then we use qPCR to, to determine that it does, in fact, affect splicing. Now, I'm not going to walk through all the other cases in detail, but I do want to show you examples of other variants we found, because they're all interesting, and they demonstrate the power of long-read sequencing. So in this case, a, parent, a patient with suspected Alstrom syndrome had a paternally inherited stop in ALMS1. That's the gene that's associated with the disease, but there was no second variant found. We did targeted long read sequencing and we found an allo insertion in exon 20, but I wasn't able to actually phase this one successfully. So what I did is I called up the lab that did the clinical exome and I said, hey, I think I see an allo in this exon, what do you see? And they looked at the data and they said, yeah, we see something strange. And then about two months later, they called us back and said they had confirmed it with PCR and Sanger sequencing. So it was the pathogenic second hit in this individual. Here, in this case, a child with biochemically confirmed lesh Nyhan, which is X-linked, had no genetic diagnosis, which was really hard on the family. And they always ask me to tell this story because he has a sister, and she wants to know what her risk is of having a son with this disease. Because it's X-linked, and if she's a carrier, she wouldn't manifest the disease, but she has a 50% chance of having a child with the disease. So we did targeted long-read sequencing, and we immediately saw a gap in coverage within HPRT1, which is the gene associated with the disease. The reads weren't linked to each other. They were actually linked to a TE-rich region of the genome, about 17 megabases away. And they were linked in such a way that suggested an inversion, but I actually wasn't able to differentiate between an inversion or an insertion of a large block of repetitive DNA. We did PCR validate the aberration, um, and then we clinically validated it using FISH. So we did it, this is indeed a paracentric inversion. And this is good news for the family because it provides a somewhat easy way to check for the variant first in mom and then eventually in the sister. Now in this case, a kiddo who has hermansky pudliak was found to have a paternally inherited stop in HPS1, the gene associated with the disease, but no second hit. <clears throat> she also had an array which was negative. So we targeted the gene and we found a 1900 base pair deletion that both the array and the exome missed. We PCR validated this and then clinical validation using an exon level array is pending. So the final example I wanna show you is from a patient who has a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but he lacks a genetic diagnosis. 
It's a young boy whose maternal uncle died in his 30s of muscular dystrophy, and his course is following his uncle's. He has an unaffected older brother, and he has he's had a pretty extensive workup, which has been unrevealing. We sequenced DMD, which, as you know, covers just over two megabases, and that didn't reveal any missense or intronic variants. But we did find an interesting structural variant, a 300 base pair expansion of a GA-rich repeat uh, within an intron, and you can see that here. Now, this was interesting, as expansions of GA-rich uh, sequences seen in other diseases, such as Friedrich's ataxia. Now, we did find that his mom's heterozygous for the expansion, and his unaffected brother doesn't carry it. So the question, of course, is how frequently is this seen in the population? Is this common or is this rare? So to get a better idea of how frequently it's seen, we uh, looked at 9,000 short read whole genomes uh, using Expansion Hunter, and we found an expansion um, within uh, at this position in 72 of those 9,000 individuals, 71 of which were females. Now, because this is a short read data, we don't totally trust it, so we're working to validate it um, using long read sequencing in some of those cases. But regardless, this is really interesting, as this would be a huge violation of Hardy-Weinberg. But this also demonstrates a challenge with long-read sequencing. We're going to find a lot of things that are difficult to validate because we don't know the frequency in the population, and also the variants would be very difficult to study in the lab. But honestly, like many of you, that's why I do this, right? Because of challenging questions like this. So what I hope I've convinced you of is that targeted long-read sequencing can be used to clarify complex structural changes and identify missing variants. I was very pleased with the variety of aberrations that we found, and that demonstrates that a large number of the things that we're missing with short reads are structural variants that are hard to identify using short read sequencing. I also want to point out that the, on average, we used a single grid ion or min ion flow cell per case. So the materials cost for us was about 600 US dollars per sample. Now we buy flow cells in bulk, of course, so that helps the price. And one thing I didn't discuss, but uh, is that we can get the results back fairly quickly. In one case, I was able to get a candidate variant back about 18 hours after receiving DNA. And that's about as fast as you can do it with short reads today. So I think what we've shown is that there's several immediate clinical applications of targeted long read sequencing. And these are in areas where we have a few testing options right now, a few clinical testing options. That includes phasing variants, um, identifying the precise position of translocation breakpoints, and then evaluating simple deletions or duplications, like determining if a duplication is tandem or not. But coming back to my primary goal, which is to both increase the rate of genetic diagnosis and also shorten the amount of time it takes to make a diagnosis, I believe we've shown that long reads could be used as a single data source that replaces most of the testing that we do today. The important question that remains is by how much will long reads increase the diagnostic rate? There's going to be challenges in interpreting the variation that we find with long reads. Those are going to be overcome by sharing of data, which we're going to do, of course. But the bigger challenge might be in performing functional studies of variants uncovered by long read sequencing. How do you put a 300 base pair GA rich uh, expansion into a fly, for example? That said, I think it's important to imagine what clinical testing could look like in five or 10 years. Using long reads as a single data set, workups that now take years could be done within days or even hours. And I expect that eventually I'll do a consult in the NICU in the morning in the neonatal ICU. And I'll come back in the afternoon to discuss the results with the family. All the tools exist to make this possible. We just need to keep working to make it a reality. So with that, I would like to thank Manafort for the opportunity to present my work here today and also thank you for your attention. Now, this work wouldn't have happened without the support of a lot of folks. I do specifically want to call out the funding support we received from the Bratman Beatty Institute for Precision Medicine here at the University of Washington, who supported this study. And then, of course, support from my mentor, Evan Eichler, and then all the members of the Eichler Lab. Thank you again.